the spectre is haunting academia, the spectre of Niklas Luhmann. All the powers of the old analog world have entered into a holy alliance to exorcise the spectre. Professors and research assistants, PhD students and undergraduates, software developers and I. Welcome to the Settlecast Manifesto. In this video, what I'm going to do is exercise the ghost of Niklas Luhmann out of the idea of what a Zettelkasten is, because it tends to confuse people a lot. When I analyze the traffic that comes to my page settler.com, I realized that a lot of traffic is actually going only to two pages, my two guides on how to use Settler as a Zettelkasten. I never intended these pages to be guides on what a Zettelkasten in itself is, but more of how to use Settler to realize such a concept of a Zettelkasten. So my intention was to create these pages to help those people who have informed themselves at other places on the internet about what a Zettelkasten is to make use of that knowledge with my app. But it turns out that a lot of information is not useful at all and to, so I want to start asking the question why is this information not helpful to many people? When I first started thinking about the opportunity to create my own Zettelkasten, I of course went on Google and searched for Zettelkasten and found some tutorials obviously, many of them uh, residing on the page zettelkasten.de which is basically the hub where you go if you want to learn how the Zettelkasten works. You will probably already have found the app Zettelkasten by Daniel Lüdecke, uh, which is supposed to resemble the, uh, the Zettelkasten by Niklas Luhmann as close as possible. And maybe you've just switched into this video and had a lot of question marks circling above your head. When I first stumbled upon the concept of Zettelkasten, I also went into the booby trap of Niklas Luhmann because I thought, okay, I have to simply completely copy his idea and then it will work, but it won't. So I had a hard time getting started and for four or five years, I had nothing resembling a Zettelkasten because there were so many constraints. For instance, if you look on the internet, they will always tell you, you need an ID, you need tags, you need related notes, you need uh, outline notes, you need meta notes, you need this and that, and the information on the notes must be structured in a way that you have first a general summary, then some more detailed explanation, and then a bullet point list containing all properties of whatever you were thinking about and this is not gonna work because there's so many constraints put on you uh, that you will very soon run into problems generating your own notes and this is something that many of the tutorials online simply neglect they simply see okay Niklas Luhmann did a Zettelkasten and it worked very well for him so our task is to understand how did the specific how did the concrete Zettelkasten by Niklas Luhmann work and how can we reproduce this with our own thoughts and our own quotes and our own notes to make use of this specific way of creating a setter custom for ourselves? And this is where the problems start. So let us take a look at Niklas Luhmann's settle custom. His settle custom was basically a, a concrete manifestation of what the word settle custom means in English, a box with notes. So he literally had these huge wooden boxes in which there were thousands of small pieces of paper on which he wrote down some thoughts. If we look closely at these notes, we can see three distinct components that will be important for us in this video. The first is a number that is mostly written on the top of the paper. This is just a number that begins at one and then counts up to the number of settles inside this box. 
So if there are 2300 notes in this one box, then the first ID number would be one and the last would be 2300. So this was basically just a continuous list of numbers so that Niklas Luhmann could identify the separate notes. The second thing that is important here is the actual content of the note, right? What he wrote on the notes, some thoughts, some quotes, references to works, ideas, something like this. This is the content of all these notes. And then there is the third element. The third element is a sequence of numbers also mostly written at the top. And these numbers referenced other notes inside the Zettelkasten. For instance, if Niklas Luhmann were to take one note and look at what he's written on these notes, and think, okay, this is basically what I've been searching for. And then he sees three numbers, a list of three numbers also written on the note. Then he knows, okay, the notes with these three IDs will also in some way relate to what is written on this one note. So he would go look for them, find the, for instance, three different notes and put all of them next to each other and then he can see all the contents of the four notes he now has in front of him and can see, aha, I, I wrote this here and this is another thought that relates to the first one and the third one is another quote by another author that also relates to this, etc. pp. And this is basically the way the Zettelkasten for Niklas Luhmann works. What his Zettelkasten actually tried to do was create a database. Nowadays, we have databases everywhere. For instance, if you're using a citation software, it's probably gonna use a database. Niklas Luhmann did not have such a program to do this work for him, so he had to do it manually. And it's actually amazing if you think about that Niklas Luhmann accidentally used exactly the form that contemporary databases on web services use. Nearly all web services nowadays store the user information when someone registers on this app inside such a relational database. So inside a relational database, information is ordered by way of using tables. And you all know tables, you have rows and columns, and in the first column normally in such a table there is an ID of the user, in the second, there is, for instance, a username. In the third column, there is an email. In the fourth column, there is a password. And whenever somebody wants to log in, the service looks inside this table, searches for the email or the username, and compares the password to the one you provided. And if this matches, then you'll be logged into. So this is how relational databases work. Normally, you have hundreds of tables inside one of these databases. Niklas Luhmann had only one. And these, this table only contained three columns. The ID column, the number on the notes, the content column, where the actual text was written, and third, the column containing a list of all the other notes that this one peculiar note referenced. This worked fine for Niklas Luhmann, but imagine what knowledge looks like. Imagine what you would like to write on such a note. Sometimes you would like to write a thought you had. Sometimes you would like to write a quote you have from a book and also add the book as reference so that you always know where you took the quote from. And maybe you also want to store an image because it's because, for instance, you're doing ethnographic research and when you observe people inside a given space, you're probably not only taking notes, but also taking photos, making videos, recording sounds. I don't know, there, there is a lot of data, a lot of arbitrary data that can be created during such an ethnographic uh, uh, research. But even if you're just a theoretician, as I am, you still will have some inconsistencies in the way the data is saved. For instance, on many notes I use tags to have some small reference as to the contents of a file. But in some notes I don't have tags at all. And while some notes feature a header, like 
a short line of text that describes what the content of this note is about, some do not. And while some notes contain a reference to a work that I used in generating this thought or quote or whatever I have put in my notes, um, it will contain this reference work. So basically you have the problem that if you try to do this by way of using tables, you would need columns to account for each of these possibilities. If you were to create a Zetri custom that is able to actually contain a lot of different information, a lot of concrete information, to go back to the abstract concrete notion again, then you will probably need a lot of columns. You will need a column ID, content, uh, related notes, but you would also need a, co uh, a, co uh, a column for references, a column for, for instance, location data for images, duration for videos, um, a description of what's inside a sound, if you record a sound, etc. PP. You have a lot of different kinds of information. And if you were just to take, to use one column called additional information, and then you would have in one row, in one note, you would have information, duration, colon, four minutes, 30 seconds. And in another note, you would have as additional information, um, some reference to a book. This might seem fine at first, but as soon as you try to automate this process and search, for instance, only for videos, how would you do this? Would you always put duration, colon, and then the actual duration of a video? Or would you sometimes just put the duration of the video without calling it duration, colon? Um, and you would very soon get into a lot of trouble just by structuring the data this way. And therefore, don't try to use such a Zetri custom. But what is the right approach? If we think again about a Zetri custom, Niklas Luhmann just wanted to store his information inside a system that is able to let him find these thoughts at a later time. So he just wanted to store his information in a way that he can always find it again. So, um, but as I said, there is a lot of different properties that the data you want to store inside such a Zettel custom can have. Because at some point you won't want to only store images, uh, to only store text in them. Sometimes you will want to store images, drawings some sketches of concepts. For instance, uh, the Lacanian concept of the real, imaginary and symbolic is always represented in three circles. Uh, I think it's called the Borromean knot. And so you would like to have this image in there, but you also need a description. So, and most of your notes don't have any images attached to them, but some of them do, and you need a way to store all of them without all the pitfalls that we just discussed. And this is why we have to think of a different concept. We now know Niklas Luhmann used a kind of relational database, but what you want to use is a graph database. But what is a graph database? Imagine for this a Zettel custom in a traditional sense, right? You have notes in them and you have these ID numbers, you have related notes, numbers, and you have the content. So, but they're all inside a box. Now imagine that you luckily, as I do, have a very small box, then simply take the notes, throw them away. What you're left with is a small box. And now imagine that you don't use one box to store all your information in, but use one box to store one chunk of information. So for instance, you have an image, you can put it in here. You have a video, you can also put it in here. You simply want to quote some lines of text from a book, you can also put it here. In case of an image, you would, I don't know, in this analogous example, you would probably use an USB stick and throw it in there. I don't have anyone uh, at, uh, at hand right now, but right, I have one. So let's imagine you were about to store an image. So you just take a uh, USB key, put it in there, and it's in here. How do you find it? Well, the first approach 
to stick with Niklas Luhmann would just be to take a piece of paper, write an ID on it, put it in here together with the image, close it and put it somewhere. And then because we're digital and not analogous, uh, your software, your information system, you would simply search for the ID and the system would uh, tell you use this box because it's in here. So of course an ID is somewhat arbitrary. It's just a number that grows over time. And to search for information uh, that may be relevant to you, forget about the ID. Many Zettelkasten approaches will still need them, but you shouldn't care too much about them. Um, so we still are left back with our empty box with this USB stick. Um, but instead of an ID, what we are going to take is um, one piece of paper and we write all the tags that this image or this video of whatever data you have in there corresponds to. So for instance, if I have an image of a Zettelkasten, ha! In here, the internet is full of Zettelkasten images from Niklas Luhmann. Um, so let's just uh, say that we have an image of a Zettelkasten of Niklas Luhmann. So I would use the tags Luhmann, Zettelkasten, node, image. Put it in here, close the box and put the box someplace. And then when I search for Zettelkasten, this box would also be returned by our system. We could look at the image and make the connection. And hopefully get new ideas. So, but this is also not the only way because for instance, let's imagine we have this image and we have a video for instance, an interview by Niklas Luhmann also. So we have another USB key, put it in another box and then we have two boxes and we put the same keys, uh, the same tags inside this box. So we have the first box let's say five tags, close it, put it back, take the next box, put in the next piece of information, put the same tags in there, put it away. And then we search for, for instance, Luman, and we will both find the one box with the image and the other box with the video. Or, as I said, remember you can also have one quote and another quote. It doesn't matter. The kind of data is irrelevant here. It's just that they are stored in boxes and you have two boxes with two disparate sets of information, right? An image is not the video in the other box, just as the quote in the one box is not like the thought you put into the other box. So, but you have these two things and they turn up in one search and you think, okay, these two are related to each other. Then we come back to the ID idea of an identifier because you have the text in here but these are so-called weak links if you search for these tags these boxes will come up but so will other boxes that may not be as closely related as the two boxes we currently have in our mind so what you would do is create an id put it also together with the tags inside this box, close it, do the same with the other one, and whenever you search for something and this one box and, and one box of these two comes up, but not the other one, you can then put a third piece of paper in here, writing the ID of the other box in here. And then whenever this box turns up, inside a search and you think, okay, this is relevant, you can see, aha, there are related boxes, you can uh, search for them, get the second box. It's really bad if you just have one box and describe something with two boxes, but anyways, I hope you have imagination enough. Um, and then you have two boxes, and then you can always pull out the second box as well, even if it did not turn up in your original search. And this is basically what a graph database looks like. You have a container and only a limited set of meta information attached to this container, like an ID, tags and related notes. But whatever is stored inside here is completely irrelevant. If it's text, then it will probably also show up in your searches. For instance, if you do a full text search on a Zettel custom that is stored in this way, you will probably also want to have results that 
had a match in the full text. But you don't need to. You can also store images, videos, sounds, whatever you like, and we, you will still be able to find them, to link them to each other, and to give IDs to these boxes. And this is basically the concept of a graph database. There is a lot more that you can, um, that you can uh, think of when thinking of uh, graph databases, but this is the gist of what a Zettel custom actually should be. So forget Niklas Luhmann and think about this. And then you will have a correct Zettel custom that works as you do, because if you use a software or any approach that requires you to not use, to not only use, for instance, an ID, tags, and this relationship concept, but also a certain way to structure the thoughts, it will not be helpful for you. You have to find your very own approach to what a Zettel custom is, and you shouldn't listen too much to people trying to tell you okay inside one of your notes you will first need a summary then a longer text and then a list of additional thoughts for instance you only need an id links to other notes and tags and always when you're starting with your own set of custom think of these boxes think of an unlimited amount of these boxes. So for every new file you create, you can imagine this box, you put anything in there, and on top of this, simply put these three notes that we talked about. The academics disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing Zettel custom systems. Let Niklas Luhmann tremble at an academic revolution. The researchers have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Researchers of all countries, unite!